Right. Okay, well, let's begin. Hi. Welcome to this Reinventing the Wheel talk. I'm speaking to you uh, from the land of the Wurundjeri people in Nam, Melbourne, and I pay my respects to, to their elders and to the ancestors of the lands where, where you come from and welcome you to this event in association with Garland Magazine and the Knowledge House for Craft, uh, which is the association of craft scholars that is developing a, a vault of uh, knowledge and looking at uh, ways of thinking of craft in a, in a broad global sense. So creating a, a body of thinking around that and this will hopefully be a spoke in the wheel of that knowledge and we're very pleased to have Susan Luckman and Amy Twigger Holroyd with us. Uh, Susan is one of the most uh, prolific craft researchers, certainly in Australia and uh, I'm sure beyond. Uh, she is Professor of Culture and Creative Industries and Director of the Creative People, Products and Places Research Centre and Cultural and Creative Industries Research Platform Leader at the Hawke uh, Centre of Excellence. And uh, Amy Twigger Holroyd is Associate Professor of Fashion and Sustainability at Nottingham School of Art and Design, and is a contributor to, to the book that we're talking about today, uh, Craft Communities, which is uh, an amazing compendium of uh, craft as it's practiced uh, and the way in which it brings people together, which is certainly relevant to the, the theme of the, the series in Garland this year, Together Spaces, which looks at how craft can be a counterpoint to the otherwise uh, atomizing effect of neoliberalism and consumer capitalism and so on. So we'll begin with uh, Susan, and I just want to uh, acknowledge your work as somebody who's produced quite a lot of research. Your books include Craftspeople and Designer Makers in Contemporary Creative Economy, Craft and the Creative Economy and Locating Cultural Work, the Politics and Poetics of Rural and Region, Regional and Remote Creativity. Sorry, that was a bit of a mouthful, but mm -hmm. uh, that's only the tip of an iceberg. So it's going to be really interesting, Susan, to, to let us in to, to this book. Uh, you know, it's an expensive book, so those who do not have access to academic libraries uh, may not necessarily be able to to distill the knowledge therein, which is why we have an event like this to to open it up. So thank you so much for for taking the time, you and Amy, to to share your knowledge like this. And um, if we could begin, Susan, if you would like to tell us a bit about your your focus as a researcher and how this book came about. Thanks, Kevin, and thank you, everybody, uh, for being here today. And before I begin, I'll just acknowledge that I'm here on Ghana land uh, in Adelaide, South Australia. Um, I'm really excited to be joining you today, and in part, it's because my hard copy actually just arrived this morning, uh, so I'm getting to hold it for the first time. Um, Amy and Rohana, I hope yours are on your, their way if they haven't arrived already. Um, excellent. Um, and it's been a number of years coming this particular uh, book it comes in some ways out an event that was held in London uh, in 2013 November 2013 to give you a sense of um, how long ago the idea started to form uh, myself and Nicola Thomas were involved in organizing an event on placing creative cultures um, for focus on craft uh, at the Open University's Camden campus I remember if I remember correctly uh, it was called Placing Cultural Work, New Intersections of Location, Craft and Creativity. And long story short, out of that, we decided there were many exciting papers. Um, there were many other people that weren't able to be at this event um, whose work we would have loved to bring together to talk to the current moment of all that was happening in craft scholarship, activism, making, practice-based research, traditional research. And we decided to put together two 
uh, book collections. Uh, the first one of those is Craft Economies, which came out uh, in 2018, I'm going to say, I think is about right. Um, and this one, obviously, Craft Communities, who's been a few years behind, but is now mercifully and wonderfully out in the world, bringing together um, multiple essays from people from all sorts of different disciplines, uh, from about nine different countries, but speaking to examples of craft practice, craft community, making, belonging uh, from many more countries than those. And it's just an exciting and diverse collection. It's wonderful to see it finally out in the world. Great. Uh, thank you, Susan. And can you share what do you think from an editorial perspective are the key takeaways from the book and, you know, some content that, that surprised you? Some of the key takeaways. Um... I think uh, the key one that came across many different chapters in different kinds of ways uh, was the way in which craft, even when it's individually practised, is embedded in communities and wider practices and wider networks and enabled by those wider networks. And it sounds almost banal to say it. But I suppose when you go to um, a lot of exhibitions, there's a real focus on the individual craftsperson or maker in some contexts that I spend a lot of time in, for example, in the global north. Whereas the picture that emerges here, and um, other people will speak to this, Amy's work speaks to this brilliantly, really shows that craft practice operates across a continuum of amateur professional. It operates across and within communities. It operates within histories in place of making. It exists within uh, longer histories of working with different materials. And so to think about craft communities, um, that the thing that popped for me was the need to actually think about what does this say about the role of authorship and making in the current moment? So quite a few of the collections speak to making practices that come from community and of the way in which I, I think they would probably not assert so much a sense of individual authorship. There's a collective ownership of the ideas to an extent. And in some ways, it just reminded me to think through some of those questions around why do some of the binaries that we often work with, amateur professional, um, uh, collective versus individual authorship, these kind of binaries, are they really still serving us very well? It's something that's also come out in Karen Patel's work that people might be familiar with, who is British researcher looking at inclusion in the craft sector and has done work with the British Craft Council. And one of her findings is uh, about the need to rethink binarisms like amateur professional and the ways in which they can often be seen to disadvantage people who are coming from non-professionally uh, trained backgrounds or at least um, training backgrounds in the global north and how we need to rethink what it means to be a skilled maker and where ideas come from. I'm not being particularly articulate with that, but that was actually just one of the key things that really emerged for me. And it came into... Um, as many people might be aware, uh, the UK and Australia are two holdouts on the UN Convention into Intangible Knowledges. I think there's movement on both sides at the moment around that. But what that cultural recognition speaks to is the fact that there are particular places that are connected to particular practices and particular communities that are so deep and deeply rooted in those communities that there is a sense almost of collective ownership of ideas, of a look, of design, of feel, of techniques. So it was the way in which communities are absolutely essential and enable individual making as well as speak to big, beautiful histories of more complex or richer communities of making, I think, was just one of the things that really jumped out of the page for me. Well, it certainly extends the you know, our understanding of, the, of craft as a studio movement which is you know, relatively international uh, to see it grounded like this. I wonder if you could say something about uh, the chapter on the Sri Lankan brassware industry. Unfortunately, Sri Rahana Ratnayaka wasn't able to, to join us uh, due to illness, but perhaps you can tell us about uh, what that chapter revealed. I thought it was quite interesting. Absolutely, and please bear with me while I, I do a quick share and I hope 
Rahana doesn't mind me uh, showing some of these images from that particular chapter. Um, this uh, chapter, which looked at the at least 300 years old brass bear industry in Kandy in Sri Lanka, um, co-authored by Rahana and Carl, uh, really speaks to, I suppose, what I'm talking about here. The ways in which uh, practices are embedded across the community uh, speak to connection, not just to perhaps a more Western or Global North model of making, selling, retail, but very directly connected in service to the community, service to the temple. Um, and the proximity to the temple is one of the key reasons why these industries have been located in this place for so long, uh, are connected through to uh, gendered histories of handing over of knowledges. And that's another thing that actually comes up in quite a few of the chapters as well, um, the way in which uh, craft histories and making are handed down through particular gender lin lineages, um, mostly uh, either you know male or female lines, and the, the kind of tensions and dynamics that that produces in communities. This is also evident in the piece, uh, Fiona Barkas's piece on uh, Greek handicraft and the tourism market. But this particular uh, piece looks at the way in which uh, the brassware industry in Kandy continues to play a central role in how the temple operates, how the community operates and provides an ongoing source of identity and income for the community. It's all connected to um, an occupation-based caste and land tenure systems, once again, showing how it's all deeply embedded in community and the associated patriarchal and apprenticeship relations that have been important to the maintenance of the skills based here. But it's a chapter that really beautifully shows how craft making, history, culture and economy are all very much interlinked and also the more than economic values and roles that craft play in communities across time and place. Yes, and it uh, it seems to reflect what is a, a a common issue, particularly in traditional crafts, which is the you know the loss of the the more um, traditional patrons such as royalty, and the replacement by tourism, yeah. uh, and the kind of tensions with tourism in terms of authenticity and so on. Did you do you see that in in this particular case? Absolutely, and that was also. Um the complexities of tourism and what happens when you face a tourist market, as I said, come up in a few of the chapters. For some, it was a source of empowerment uh, in Fiona's piece, um, at least in terms of female household and caregiving and the power it gave women within traditional households because the kind of handcraft that she was talking about in um, that part of Greece was traditionally done by women. So with them bringing in more income, they could start to make claims for greater status within households and greater um, uh, say in the way households were configured. But at the same time, you also have other examples of the ways in which tourism can start to distort practices or just create new disruptions. And I certainly know this in some of my own research on First Nations craft. Um, I've spoken to Aboriginal makers and artists across the country who feel under pressure to sort of perform a historicized form of um, Aboriginal uh, creative practice rather than maybe the more contemporary art they wish to engage in, where there's particular assumptions from the non-Aboriginal marketplace about what they want from um, tourist or uh, visitor related um, items. So there's a whole lot of a whole lot of complexity there around some places, you know, there's there's good and bad, there's push and pull um, around how the demands the way you can meet and serve and get income from a tourist market then create particular kinds of aesthetics and demands upon what it is you get to do and issues of compromise and authenticity around that. And uh, tell, me, tell, me Susan, sorry. tell me, Susan, uh, as you know, as somebody who's produced a lot of books, that these are, are links in a chain that uh, each book produces a set of questions that then prompt further research. What do you think the questions are prompted by this book that you would be interested to pursue further? I, th I think one goes back to that issue of authorship um, and ownership. I can't remember their name and I've looked for years to try and figure out who it was. And 
I was at a conference years ago, early days of social media, and this person was making the argument that we're going to look back on sort of the last 200, 300 years, at least uh, once again across much of the West or the global North, as I should call it, um, as the aberration in our understanding, at least of the written word and how we collectively author things. And the argument was the Gutenberg Press created this moment when we could sort of have the individual authors of books rather and put our name to it very clearly. This is what I did. Um, and that actually went against the history of oral traditions, which are collectively held. Um, and prior to that, we're actually we're better at acknowledging the debt that we give to the people that came before us and the people around us and our culture and our embeddedness in place for what cultural knowledges and skills we bring. And I don't want to take anything away from any individual artists and makers here. Obviously, there's still hands that make things, ideas formed in brains. And so I'm not seeking to completely undermine that. And uh, just going back to a discussion we were having before um, people joined us, Kevin, the fact that you know there are clear examples of knockoff culture that we can see out there where you know great design ideas are taken by Main Street, High Street companies and just made very cheaply, potentially in problematic ways and pumped out at very cheap prices, completely undercutting the original work um, and not uh, acknowledging the fact that it's somebody else's design. But I actually think moving forward, one of the challenges, not just for crafts, but a lot of areas of creative practice is what's going to be the impact of AI on the kinds of ideas around authenticity, of authorship, of where we get our ideas and how they form, given that that's a way of effectively sourcing from collective histories without attribution necessarily inappropriately. So I think there's going to be some interesting challenges emerging there for how we understand creative authorship even in the craft space where something still needs to be made because of the kinds of changes that are occurring there and I don't want to see them just as bad going back to my point about that sort of Gutenberg moment maybe it's about um, there's something there around the need to recapture and acknowledge uh, the debt we owe to our embeddedness in making communities and the way in which that does come from nowhere doesn't come from nowhere and I just think of some of my colleagues in the academic space who are just brilliant at, at giving presentations and acknowledging all the work that they brought into their particular presentation as because it didn't come out of nowhere. Um, it doesn't mean that you haven't done something unique and different with it, but it's about just that situatedness of your own practice. Which goes back to your interest in the adoption of intangible cultural heritage uh, as a way of recognising that, I guess. Would, would you mind um, disabling your screen share so we can no problem. see you again? Here I am. Yes, perhaps it's a, a point now to, to bring in Amy. Uh, Amy, your chapter also looked at the way of expanding our understanding of craft beyond its professional and to include the, the amateur practice as well. Would you like to, to speak to, to your chapter? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote it quite a while ago. So it's kind of a, it's like a little um, time capsule for me looking, looking back. Um, but uh, I wrote it, I think just after I'd finished my PhD um, and just after a point when I'd, I'd stopped running, um, uh, I'd come to the end of about six years of running uh, craft workshops where I, I shared uh, skills in, in hand and machine knitting. And the, when the call for chapters came out, it just seemed like a really great sort of opportunity and invitation to reflect on that experience of having um, run these workshops um, and connect it to uh, scholarship that I was aware of that, about things that Susan's uh, written about and has talked about today of sort of um, pressure on uh, craftspeople to perform a certain type of persona. And like, I could really relate to that from my experience of running these workshops. So I uh, took the opportunity to reflect on it. So um, a bit of my background. So I, I trained as a, a knitwear designer um, and then started running my own knitwear label in about 2004. Um, and then after a few years of doing that, I extended my practice to include uh, running uh, kind of participatory knitting projects in the community where there was some funding available to do that kind of thing. Um, and also running these 
uh, hand and machine knitting workshops, mainly machine knitting at my studio. Um, and I did that yeah, for about six years. So I was reflecting on that experience and I also took the opportunity to um, interview slash have a great conversation with um, a good friend of mine, Rachel Matthews, who had quite a similar practice. Hers was focused on hand knitting and crochet rather than uh, machine knitting. Uh, and she ran probably more shorter workshops than I did, but had we had very similar experiences of basically opening up our studios to people paying to come on a workshop experience. We would run the workshop. Um, and we'd had kind of informal chats previously about our uh, the experience of doing this thing. So we 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 um, I went down and, and stayed with her and we had this uh, kind of great interview that helped me to, so I was reflecting on my experiences, but of course, talking to somebody else who had a, a comparable experience helped me to draw out what was what was particular about what I'd experienced as well as learning, you know, getting more about what, what she'd uh, what she'd done. Um, so I guess I'm really interested in my, you know, as I've said, my, my practice as a professional designer maker was about designing and making knitwear and selling it to people as, a, as finished items. I did that for, you know, quite a lot of years, but I, you know, my practice extended to include this support of amateur making, um, which was, you know, very practically another stream of income. It's really hard to make a living from selling cardigans to people. If you can also run some workshops, you get a different market, different lot of people can come, you know, kind of um, spread the spread the, the opportunities. Um, but I also found it really interesting and it gave me different ways of relating to people other than just trying to sell things to people. Um, so I'd kind of really enjoyed this experience of, of uh, getting to know people and working with them in that way. Um, and in my research, I, my my PhD research was about me as a as a trained designer using my um, my design skill to support amateur creativity in the field of knitting. And so, I guess I was quite alert to the the idea of the kind of the interaction between the professional and the amateur and how how those how those relationships kind of play out. And I'd you know I'd kind of lived it in these workshops. So Rachel and I, you know, reflected on kind of the general experience of running a workshop, the fact that it's not just being in the place at the time. And here we are, this is what we're doing. There's all the preparation. I mean, the hoovering, I was always hoovering at 6 a.m. in my workshop. It's like the, the things that nobody knows that you're doing. Um, or as we, I, I smiled when I looked back at it this morning, just a quote that we decided, we acknowledge that the main work is count the scissors, make sure you've got the tea bags sorted is like the very crucial thing because you're obviously going to host people in your space. Um, and then during the workshop itself, you've been being the host, like making people sure people are comfortable and happy and they know where the toilet is and is everyone okay. Um, but also, you know, teaching and sharing skills. So kind of balancing uh, these things. Um, and I would say that the, I uh, wrote a little bit in the chapter about the motivations of people who are, Coming to do one of these workshops, um, I would say in general, there's a sense that they want to kind of learn from an expert. That's why they're choosing to spend some money to come and do this thing. Um, but often it's also just about giving themselves kind of some designated chunk of time to, to do something and kind of focus on themselves. Sometimes, you know, people with busy lives, caring responsibilities, they've, they're kind of carving out some time and coming to a what they saw as a kind of designated creative space was part of that so then that's really interesting because that's my normal working space and I want to you know the kind of idea of authenticity um comes out there um I guess there's also I felt that people you know what the opportunity at a, a in-person workshop is that the transmission of tacit knowledge so you can really show them how you do something and I found myself quite often um saying this isn't how you'll see it written down in the book, but this is how I really do it. The way it's written in the book is because that's the only way you can write it down in a book. The way I really do it, you just wouldn't be able to capture it in the neat instructions of a, a you know machine knitting manual or whatever. And I think people quite like that. Um, but there was also a lot of multi-directional learning. So it wasn't just straightforwardly from me as a teacher to the participants as often. If people are all learning to machine knit at the same time, actually, they have better tips for each other 
than I do because they're unearthing, you know, in a slightly kind of niche activity. Where, where are, who is the person that can still service the machines? Where can you still get the spares? Where do you get your yarn from? You know, they're sharing those tips. Um, but there were kind of three key um, issues that I discussed in the chapter. So one was, I have to say, sort of, you know, you talked about books inspiring other books or people drawing on ideas. So this one very much came from Susan. I don't know if you'll uh, remember, I think that you gave a talk at the University of Leeds in about 2015, 14, 15, something like that. And I remember you talking about, you know, really um, engaging me about in certain contexts, the kind of the pressure on the, the craftsperson to be authentic in some way. Uh, and I was able to really relate that to this, you know, sort of uh, the need. If people have paid to come to your workshop and do something, they kind of want you to be an authentic expert. You know, they, they want to kind of trust. Who are you? Who are you to, to tell me these things? Um, so Rachel and I discussed, you know, the various ways, the various nods we were making to our experience or our connections. And, you know, she she had things of, She's, she'd studied and taught at Central St. Martin's, so that gives you a certain, um, you know, uh, cachet in the sort of uh, design craft field. But also she grew up in the Lake District and, you know, learned to knit from Cumbrian uh, sheep farmers, which then taps in. So you've got quite a nice spread of tapping into different sources of authority. Um, I was sell designing and selling knitwear, so I'd have my knitwear there that was like, look, I'm... I'm I exist in the marketplace. My designs are, are sold, but I would also tell them about my grandmother teaching me to knit, so a similar sort of balance. Um, but both of us quite, quite felt quite uncomfortable about sort of needing to to make that pitch, if you like. It was implicit, but it, it, it felt quite uncomfortable. Um, the second thing that we talked about was um, yeah, the, the space that people were coming to and that they wanted to come to like a real studio, but we actually had to both kind of stage our studios to seem real because we had to hide the weird stuff that just led to like too many weird conversations. Um, and actually sometimes it was the things that connected to my own amateur practice that I would have to hide, sort of hide away. And it's not like I was trying to put on a, a, a it wasn't a sham, um, but people like, they they will look through everything. They'll go in the cupboards and they'll, they'll look through the shelves. Oh, what's this? And it's just sometimes the weirder the thing that I had, the longer the conversation would ensue about it. And then the less time there is to, to actually teach them any machine knitting. So I was kind of hiding away some of the, the, the slightly more odd items um, in order to kind of uh, create a more straightforward professional making space um and then the third one the third issue that i flagged up was um the, the interesting experience when people coming to the workshops often they were coming because they wanted to sort of develop their their amateur creative practice they were very ha happy in their hobby status i don't say that with any um negative uh, connotations they were very happy with the, the way they were doing things and they wanted to develop their skills, you know, a great sense of kind of personal development and creativity. Sometimes people would come because they wanted to set up a business as a knitwear designer maker. Um, and that could be quite problematic in that they wanted to learn things really quickly. Like, okay, yeah, whatever, just, just show me how to do this. And it's like, with the best will in the world, you are not going to learn to be an expert machine knitter in a weekend. Um, and so there was a kind of balance of, and also like, I can tell you from bitter experience how hard it is to make a living by, by making, knitting some things and trying to sell them to people. So I'm also kind of feeling a bit wary that I don't want to give you a, a false sense of how amazingly successful and easy this life as a, as a, a craftsperson is. Um, but I wouldn't want to be act as a gatekeeper, but I also it's a little it's a little bit difficult when people are like, tell me everything you know in this weekend that I've paid 150 quid to come to, you know, um, perhaps shows 
not the most respect for the the skill on the and the long hard won um you know the, the long road to developing it and, and gaining that knowledge so overall that was a kind of potted um summary of the the chapter but i guess my um my academic uh, summary of it is it's really a delicate balancing act for the uh the designer maker the craftsperson opening up their studio to run workshops in this way there's a lot going on and it's really interesting but there's really a lot going on because you really are counting the scissors sorting out the tea bags and negotiating all of the people's expectations which can be very different in one room um so i did always heave a great sigh of relief when each one was over but then i did always organize some more um because it was a a really interesting space for interactions and, and learning things. I mean, the conversations at these workshops is what led to my me doing my PhD in the first place. So, you know, such a, a great place for conversations, but a complex uh, balancing, balancing act needed. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Amy. I'm sure many can relate to your experience. Uh, certainly in Australia, it's been quite significant, the transformation of, of many ceramic practices from being a studio potter to now teaching workshops, given the huge demand there is for, for evening pottery classes, people tired of spending a day in front of a screen, seeking to have some sort of reconnection with materials. But clearly some of the, what we don't hear about, you know, are the, the staging of it that uh, you discuss. And I think uh, that raises a lot of interesting issues. We've got some time now to discuss and uh, some of what's come up already, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the people in the house with us. Uh, fellow board members, uh, Sharon, uh, Tang Delista is here, Peter Carlin, uh, Liliana Murray, uh, and of course from Lagi Mama, uh, Barbara and Kessa, uh, welcome. Uh, people from Australia, uh, from uh, World Craft Council Asia Pacific, Lindy Joubert, World Craft Council Australia, Louise Hanby. I'm very pleased to see Atefe Masani Salam, uh, whose uh, article, joint article about the thinker maker in contemporary craft in Iran, we've just published in Garland magazine. Who else is here? There's a few new names as too. Oh, Rahana Rathnaya Salam Atefe. Uh, Rahana is here. I didn't see that. Uh, so that's that's good. Uh, Saras. Hello, uh, Kavian, and hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. <laughs> hello. And uh, Lauren uh, Evelacqua is here. Feel free to, to join us and uh, to join us in the house to, to talk about these things. But just to, to kick us off, uh, I wonder... Susan and Amy, what you would think about uh, uh, a term that's that's used within World Craft Council Asia Pacific, Lindy would know about this, which is the, of course, a term that's been used in the past, which is the craft master. Mm. Uh, recently, there was uh, in China a process of uh, assessing who are the craft masters of the Asia Pacific region and uh, Thanks to the good work of uh, Lagi Mama and uh, Lindy and others, uh, we we had a number. I think was it about eight or nine from uh, the South Pacific region uh, acknowledged as being craft masters. And it was quite a different uh, set of set of criteria to what you would normally get in prizes, you know, which is about the work. This was particularly about the the contribution that the, the individual makes uh, in terms of teaching their apprenticeships, and what's particularly, certainly in countries like China, what's particularly uh, admired is where the, the master has actually taught those who've gone on to themselves be masters. So there is that kind of community transmission that you were talking about, Susan. And I know there was that book, Masters of Craft, you might recall from the States, which talked about the what you might see as a more hipster kind of embrace of moral uh, manual trades, uh, but it still used the word master. But I'm just curious to know 
Susan and Amy and anyone else who wants to chime in whether whether this word might might be one that could be recovered to speak to the the way in which uh, craft is something that draws on the the work of of certainly previous generations. It's actually something um, that's been coming up in some of my more recent research. I have spent much of the last four years trying to or doing a parallel study to the British Craft Council one where they sought to locate craft skills across the whole economy. And I've come up a whole lot of data out of that, which I'm not going to bore people with today. But one of the things that emerged there was the challenge of having affordable, decent apprenticeship systems, especially on a small scale, one-to-one, -one. Um, and the fact that especially some of the more craft practices that people in this room would be interested in are just not well served by those kind of structures. Instead, we're getting more pressure for people to do the kind of work that Amy was just speaking to. The number of grants I'm increasingly seeing where people, you know, who 10 years ago, people would have said, oh, you know, make money by selling online. Now governments are sort of, can you play into the well-being space? Can you, you know, do those kind of sessions in your ceramic studio? Can you do any of these other kind of ways to bring in money rather than having the space to really drill down deeply into expertise and maybe train once again deeply somebody else at a very profound level? So I actually think um, it's absolutely critical to acknowledge the importance of having people who have deep dive skills and also who are then transmitting that, who are then seeking to share that with somebody in a very deep way because the spaces and support systems, at least in the countries I'm familiar with, are not very good at enabling that. And people who are experts are increasingly being told to diversify their offerings with all the kind of labour that goes into that, as we just heard from Amy, which takes you away from your own practice. Uh, thinking of Master of Crafts and Hipsters, uh, Kevin, um, I know a, a, there's a fantastic knife maker here in South Australia who's got a waiting list for his waiting list uh, for people who are wanting to come in and bring old family saws and old rifles in and turn them into, into beautiful uh, knives. But he's just so frustrated that he can't keep continuing with his master practice of being a knife maker because he's too busy teaching people to do it once. Um, so th I think it's really important to acknowledge that high level of expertise in a current economic environment in countries at least like Australia where we're not really supported to know and go deep and to share those kind of knowledge. It's the craft skills I'm largely looking at in that study more recently. Apprentices would leave um, halfway through training because they could quickly get a job on a building site doing new builds, nothing particularly adventurous. You know, we're going to lose that depth the making thickness, I refer to it, if we don't invest and respect deep skills and the transmission of them. But Amy may have other thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess my initial um, embodied response is that I I, I don't connect with the, the term master. I mean, partly it feels a bit gendered, but that's you know one element. Um, but I think beyond that, I, I was just reflecting on, is it because I come from a, a post-industrial society where the, there isn't a sort of um, a sense of unbroken lineage of a craft tradition being pressed, passed down through apprenticeship? Um, I absolutely don't have that uh, lived experience. Um, but I think I wonder whether it's also... But I think there might be people um, in the UK, say, who have that. So people who are uh, featured on the um, uh, Heritage Craft Association's list of intangible cultural heritage, you know, the person who knows how to make the particular basket that does a particular job that's been made for you know generations. Maybe they would have that. So I think it's partly also because I'm a knitter and hand knitting is such a... Um, widely practiced craft and often the most staggeringly amazing levels of skill are not uh, is not found amongst professionals it's found amongst people who they're able to do the deep dive into the into the technique purely because for them it's not uh, uh, 
a commercial activity. Um, and I guess so there's something about that kind of that widespread skill and the feeling that it belongs to everybody. I have a you know very deep um feeling and I I have always been influenced for for a long time been influenced by um Elizabeth Zimmerman, who was an influential um knitter. I think that she was originally British and then moved to the States and she had like TV programs and all all sorts. I've got these books. I don't really have a, a direct cultural sense of her her importance, uh, but she was a very influential uh knitting uh teacher i suppose through her books and programs uh, and she has a very um uh, engaging amusing way of uh, communicating things which is she doesn't really give like precise instructions it's a lot like come on you can figure this out yourself and her term is unvent so she says that she hasn't ever invented anything she unvented them because surely some some uh, you know people with a couple of brain cells to, to rub together must have come up against this problem and they've probably figured out the same thing that I've figured out. Uh, and so her, so, you know, I've, you know, I've developed particular machine knitting techniques, which I invented, you know, I figured them out for a reason and I would share them with people and they go, Oh, you've invented this thing. I'm like, I'm sure someone else has figured this out too. I'm just showing you the way that I do it. Um, so yeah, there's a, a number of, things there where I I'm, I feel like I'm in a bit of a tension where I really appreciate the deep um, expertise that Susan's talking to, but I also really, really feel um, alive to the kind of widely, weirdly distributed skill of, of hand knitting in, in particular, I, I suppose, in the context that I'm, that I'm familiar with. Um, I wonder, Peter, seeing you're in the room here, uh, you're, for many people, a master of your craft, uh, which uh, I can recall is glass etching uh, in in Gippsland. Uh, how does the word master resonate with you? Is it something that you would aspire to, and you would feel would give you know value to to the skills that you you have and can transmit? Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Should be on the bottom left of the Zoom screen. I would put it down to the community that you're involved in. If you were in a glass engraver in a community in Europe somewhere and lately in America, you would have the chances to have students to show and demonstrate and teach the craft. But if you're very isolated, like Australia, where it's not accepted, uh, it, the term master really doesn't make much sense. That's my attitude. And much as I'd like to have the possibility of teaching and passing on the skills and trade, it's just not something without an, a community that knows what it is in the first instance. So that's just the way I look at it. It would be good in Europe. And there are people acknowledge that way. Most of them, it's been passed on through an apprenticeship or an educational system. So I think you need that community around to have a master's as accepted. I remember um, Abe Muriata, the wonderful Darwin Weaver from North Queensland, uh, spoke about himself trying, you know, aspiring to be a master of craft. And you know, maybe in an Indigenous context, uh, the word master can have a different meaning because it also relates to being an elder and that you come with, as well as the, you know, the skills for, for making, it could also be skills for care for country, even the stories that you tell that are passed on as well as language. And that may be a, a way in which this term resonates. Peter, do you want to speak to your comment about mastery? Peter's in China, so sometimes difficult to to hear from her. Uh, hello, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, the concept of um, the master really came into focus for me 
when I was looking at a book of um, photographs of um, traditional and trade practices in France um, by a photographer called Laura Volkerding, and the book was called Solomon's Temple. And uh, in it, there were a number of images of masterpieces, and these were, I believe, produced um, to demonstrate mastery um, and then um, you know, perhaps be recognised within the guild or trade. And I, I was wondering also if this idea uh, translates into or across to academia mm -hmm. and the idea of a master's degree. Indeed, we certainly bear that heritage. Yeah, yeah. And we've lost a few things along the way as well. Mm. Um, I know that, you know, thinking about Atefo's article on the, the thinker maker, that's that's a kind of an alternative um, concept which kind of relates to the designer maker and these hybrid uh, kinds of practice that include not just the making, but also in terms of thinking, the, the teaching, the workshops, but also the podcasts, the Instagram feed, you know, all of the the way information is generated alongside the making. Uh, Louise, uh, you're on. You've taken yourself off mute. I can always tell if somebody's got something to say if they take themselves yes, off. Yes, I I would if if possible. Um, sure. Uh, because you brought up the um, indigenous aspect and this concept of elder, master, etc. Uh, I think, uh, for example, if we look at the Western system. Uh, we know now a number of people, and I think most recently Lola Greeno has received an honorary PhD from, I think, University of Tasmania. So Lola Greeno so, is the Tasmanian Aboriginal. Yes, Tasmanian Mark, Aboriginal. Hmm. And for her fantastic uh, shell, mariner shell necklaces, amongst other things. So I think we have kind of two sides of the coin. We've got um, an Indigenous person who has been given the equivalent of what in Western society we would say as being a very high respected position. But within, let's say, we'll just keep talking about Lola for a minute, but within her own society in Tasmania, um, people acknowledge that, you know, she is, if you'd like, the top of the line, whether or not they use the word master or, or I think elder is a bit conflicting. I don't, because lots of people are elders, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are masters of a particular skill in the way that we're talking about. So I think it's a kind of maybe not the best way of expressing it, but like in Tasmania, her peers know what Lola's position is. She doesn't actually need a title, if you know what I mean. I think it's a Western idea that we feel like we have to bestow this title on someone. Not that she is unhappy about it. I wouldn't say that because, of course, she lives in the same society that we do and that kind of title is acknowledged. So I think it's a bit tricky to kind of, I think, put the two together to mean the same thing because I don't think they actually do mean the same thing like elder, master. They're not the same thing. Um, I mean, for example, in Gapawiak, where I worked for many years, if something very special, like a ceremonial basket, was needed, everyone knew exactly which person was the one that you went to, and they would go to that person. They knew that this person 
was the best person that had the most skills and could do the best job for the thing. And so there was no title for this person. Everyone just knew that this was the person. I don't know if any of that makes sense. I probably just muddled the waters a bit, but I just thought I would. Well, you're talking about a different um, system, but I wonder if uh, we could bring in uh, our friends from Moana Oceania, uh, Barbara and Kessa, to talk, because obviously the work you've done in, in programs like Talk Story and the wonderful new book coming out of Nui, about uh, Nui uh, uh, culture, which is quite a massive tone, which we hope to promote through Garland magazine. Uh, if you could uh, have any thoughts about the way this works in, in Moana, Oceania, whether there are special ways of distinguishing those who, who are there to carry on particular techniques. Who's going to go first? <laughs> I'll, I'll let my I'll let my elder go first. <laughs> Tell my mother, and then I'll tag after you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, yes. Um, it's interesting we're talking about this because I think with Gaitata, um, Watson and Louisa Humphrey, um, who are who are you know so grateful to be you know in ha even be considered, let alone and um, be receiving these awards. And when, you know, when we were talking about masters, they've always said, we never look to ourselves as masters because we're always learning. Um, and I think for them in the context of being diaspora, so they're Kiribati mamis, um, and they've continued their Kiribati weaving, but using the resources that are available here in Aotearoa. So um, Gaidaita shared that when she first moved over to Aotearoa, um, she was adopted by these two fires, these two um, these two older older mamas, Māori, um, Māori indigenous mamas, um, who, when they realised she was Kiribati, and they said, "Oh, do you weave?" And she goes, "Well, I haven't weaved since I left home, and then um, because I don't have I don't have you know the pandanas here." So then they said, "Okay, this you come with us." So they put her in the car, and then they found some harikeke on the road. And then they explain to her how you actually pick, but also um, how you cut the harakeke, but also the words that you have to speak to be able to, to take them properly, you know, off the land and, and acknowledging that they are Kiribati. And I think with this kind of um, journey, I think for them has, has been an incredible one because they've been teaching for 50 years. You know, they've been teaching here in Aotearoa. They've been teaching Kiribati weaving. They've been keeping that. The, you know, their Kiribati of making practices alive, um, which has been just such a, a joy for so many, but they very much are, um, yeah, never consider themselves masters, even though they're now in their 70s and 80s, but are still, but also realise, I think, now that they are at that age where they just want to, um, they just want to teach, they just want to continue to impart knowledge because they know that one of them said she's not, she's not far from visiting Jesus so but yeah I'll take his oh sorry and just from a Samoan point of view um we 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 um, have tufunga um which is a term that we use and tufunga is actually someone um for example if they do the tattooing or if they do um carving or depending on what genre um it's something that is either gifted to them by the village um by the village um Makai is so by the village council almost, um, but it's something that they actually have to, it's it's a collective village, I suppose, um, acknowledgement, but it's, it's going through our own cultural institutions back in the villages. So they have to do all of these hard yards before they, be, before they get given that title of tufunga. And so it, it really is a journey, but in a different kind of, you know, institute of, of learning. But, you know, I think sometimes the village institutions of learning are a bit harder. <laughs> but yeah, mm. I'll take this. Uh... Yeah, Kesa, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, just sorry, just briefly, but just acknowledging thank you, um, Susan and Amy, for your share and, and everyone else has contributed. And I think just really um, enjoyed what you just shared, um, Louise. I think the master title, you know, it is very Western because like B said, 
Um, I'm Tongan, um, Barbara is Samoan, and we live here in Aotearoa, of which Māori is Indigenous Peoples of Aotearoa, and we have 17 plus ethnic island nations that have diaspora communities here in Aotearoa, of which we are two of those 17, and a lot of the work that we're doing is um, how to privilege and foreground some of um, the our holders of knowledge in various forms, whether it's the making of a basket, whether it's performance, by a whole variety of things. And they have their own terminologies, like um, Barbara said, you know, with tufunga. If you say that you're a tufunga um, and you're from that community, you know if they're a real one or not a real one, <laughs> you know, so your community mm -hmm. knows, like what you said, yeah. um, Louise, that this person has been given um, this acknowledgement, but it's also being acknowledged in the community. And that's the same with us. And I think the, the challenge here is the communities and the creators and the makers that we work with, they are not the ones that are foregrounded in mainstream spaces. And hence, you know, the work that we're doing um, with Luis and Gaitaita, they would never consider, they're a little bit shy because we didn't even, we didn't even let them know, actually, we put them forward and we put them forward because like B said, together, collectively, they've got over 100 years knowledge and experience and they've actually been key in retaining and maintaining their Kiribati knowledge and practices of their material culture and 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 their um, values here in Aotearoa because they were sort of the old, you know, the first, you know, arrival from Kiribati. So it's it's known within the community, but they would not put themselves out there. So we would do that. So I think it's um, the challenge for us is that there are, we can openly say this, that there are people who are happy to take on that master level, but they are not at that level. Hence why the role, the work that we're doing, we feel is really important because there are those like Luis and Gaitaita, they'll just sit there in the back doing what they're doing, but they are at their level. And how do we, they don't want to say I'm here and this is what I'm doing, but if they're actually playing a crucial part in retaining, maintaining their culture and heritage here in Aotearoa, then everyone needs to know that they're masters. So I think we have no qualms pushing um, those people, you know, our, our mm -hmm. communities in that space. And we do it in a way that that is informed. So we do it in a way that we know they are at that level and we can navigate those two spaces. But I think there's pros and cons with, with those um, awards, and especially when you're labelled that, um, and especially if it's labeled to someone where you know it's at the at the sort of over someone who is in the community and is the real master, but no one knows about them. So there are those kind of challenges, but also knowing that language is a barrier where all of our communities have our own terminologies that 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 indicate that they are a master, which is only known within that community. So yeah, loving the Talanoa and thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank to you share. so much. We've sort of come to the to the end of the hour now, and I just want to acknowledge how this conversation has helped us understand the importance of recognition, but the fact that there are many different frameworks for recognition that one doesn't necessarily um, trump the other, that uh, they're, they're suitable to different contexts, like the, the way Kessa and Barbara uh, with Pacifica Mamas, the mama as a, as a figure has developed, certainly in the way in which you've presented uh, the arts and crafts of Pacific Moana. And well, maybe another time, I was hoping at some stage we'd get on to, you know, the particularly Australian perspective in this, uh, Susan, because uh, even though I'm Australian, a lot of our conversations have been about other cultures. And it, it does seem like we do have a particular focus on welfare in craft. I'm thinking about the work of um, Jess Adam Stein, that uh, was part of a podcast interview that I did, the, the conference, um, Hands on Deck, uh, looking at work and relates perhaps to what Ezra, Ezra Shales was, was telling us in one of our events about the importance of, 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 of acknowledging industrial craft. Uh, so it'd be interesting at some stage to think about, you know, the, the context that you see Australian work has in the kind of broader international scene. If I could just quickly say one of the things um, I, I love, okay, so commu the community knows, I, I think is, the, you know, absolutely is the key thing here. But one of the other things I heard there was the importance of permission of the right to take materials, whether it's shells, whether it's um, fibre. Um, and so the, the, the All Hands on Deck conference is very much about design craft in the context of climate crisis. 
So I think there's something too about who's got permission to use resources because we know they can be trusted to use them well. That's worth thinking about there as, as well. Thank you, Kevin. Good. Well, our next um, telenor is with uh, um, the Jugout Project, which is an, an amazing platform for uh, sharing openly work from, from anthropologists working in material cultures, particularly in a religious context. And but from because it's from the states, it's uh, at a time that may be a challenge to those in the eastern hemisphere. I think we just we just mm. get in Australia at around nine a.m. Thankfully, it's mid morning for our friends across the Tasman, but uh, we'll be recording it anyway, which should be quite interesting. But I think that uh, also speaks to for one of the new bridges that uh, links. Uh, academic discourse to communities of practice that I think uh, our Talanoa has certainly helped realise. Thank you so much, uh, Susan and Amy, for your time. And thanks, everyone, for keeping the house warm. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you.